It's so easy to feel overwhelmed by everything that seems wrong with the world today. Our bees are dying, not by the thousands, but by the millions, and we don't understand why. There's dire predictions about climate change that suggest that by the year 2100, some of our greatest cities will be underwater. And in 2010 alone, more than 600,000 people died of malaria, most of them children in underdeveloped countries. But what can you do? You're just one person, right? I'm sure everyone here in this crowd does their bit, but I'm equally sure that there are some days when just recycling your soda cans or writing a check to UNICEF once a year doesn't feel like enough. Well, I have some good news for you. You actually can make a difference. It's called citizen science, and it's a way for average people like you and me to do real, honest to goodness, help answer the big question science, even if you never finished high school. So what is citizen science? Roughly speaking, it's science done by amateurs. And there are three main characteristics. One is that when you do citizen science, you're actually the researcher and not a test subject. So if you're starting to get worried about having to give up a kidney or something, we're okay. Two is that it's conducted by, or put together by, researchers. So it's a little bit different than the image you might have of an amateur scientist working away in his or her basement or bedroom. And three is that it's done by large groups of people all at once. So you can think of it as crowdsourced science, or distributed science, or even participatory science. Now, citizen science and amateur science has actually been around forever. It used to be that if you were interested in science, you just explored the world around you. And you had the time and the money to go do that. But the image you have today of a professional scientist is probably someone who had, had or is wearing a white lab coat, and maybe glasses, and so on. And the reason why that's changed recently is because in order to make new discoveries, you had to specialize in order to break new ground. So there's been a shift in the last 100 and 200 years or so from amateur science to professional science. And some of the people I'm thinking of who are actually amateur scientists were people like Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel and Eva Ekblad. So if citizen science has actually been around for a long time, why are you just hearing the concept now? And the answer is, as with most things, that technology has changed a lot of stuff. For example, we now have the ability to collect huge amounts of data about a particular subject. For example, the Hubble Space Telescope alone has made more than one million images in its lifetime. And obviously that's more than one scientist, even a team of scientists could hope to go through in their own lifetimes. And of course we have the internet, that big game changer. The internet has grown in so many ways. It's in different countries now all over the world, and it's also in different places. It's in your pocket, it's in your thermostat, it might even be in your refrigerator. And of course, the cost of transmitting data and storing it has come down tremendously as well. Science departments haven't been immune to budget cuts any more than anybody else has, and there just aren't the resources in the labs. So like the gentleman earlier in the film, they've had to be more creative with how we do science. We also have something called cognitive surplus. And by that I mean here, at least in the Western world, we actually have the time to do this kind of thing. We're not living a hand-to-mouth existence. Now I know, a lot of us like to think we're busy, but consider this. In a single year, Americans watch more than 200 billion hours of television. Just Americans so we probably have a bit more time than we like to admit. And of course, we have those big problems I mentioned earlier. The big, hairy, intractable, seemingly complicated problems that are not likely to be solved by a single person with a flash of insight and a really good patent lawyer. So, that's enough background. It's time to get our geek on. I've developed a framework that sort of divides up all the projects that are available to you. And so you can find out where you might want to dive in and where you might find your, your comfort level. And the first one is really easy. You can just open your wallet and donate. 
I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of places like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Those are crowdfunding sites. And with those sites, you can individually donate to a project that you'd like to see get off the ground. It might be a book project, it might be an independent film, and of course, you can search for citizen science projects on those big sites. But there are also sites very specifically directed towards science programs, scientific studies. So the one I show here called experiment.com, you can directly fund scientific studies that interest you. So if you're a space geek like me, you might want to fund something about, can you, can you improve space propulsion? Or if you're a parent with children, you might be interested in funding a study about ADHD. So there's all kinds of projects available, and you can cut out the middleman and make sure your dollar is going to something you truly want to see investigated. Leveling up, set and forget. With these projects, all you need is a computer and a reasonably decent internet connection. You simply download a little bit of software, put it on your computer, set a few options, and then you let it do all the heavy lifting. And basically what you're doing is you're donating your computer's processing power to the project so that scientists don't have to depend on getting time on the local supercomputer. So if you're interested in doing something about that malaria issue, you can download a program called Fight Malaria at Home. And what it does is it runs through a bunch of drug testing models to find out what is the most cost-effective treatment for malaria. If you're interested in doing something about climate change, you could run climateprediction.net. And this one, because climate change science is so complicated and there are so many potential variables, with this one, it runs through all kinds of different potential scenarios so we can get a better handle on what might actually happen with climate change. Web-based activities. Now, here's where it gets way more interesting and interactive. It turns out one of the things that computers still can't do better than humans is figure out what's in an image. So a lot of the web-based citizen science projects want you to look at images and tell the researchers what it is you're seeing. So if you go to a site called zooniverse.org, you can join a project there called Old Weather. And with that one, you just look at images of old ship's logs from the Navy or the Coast Guard, and you transcribe what was said in the log. The researchers get data from ship's logs and really, really accurate information about how weather patterns were in that particular area of the world. And of course, you get to snoop through people's logs and find out what happened in, in various historical times around the world. If you want a deep dive, you could go underwater with Seafloor Explorer. This one has had a robotic submarine taking pictures of the ocean floor. And what you do is you identify what you see in the picture, whether it be some fish or some other aquatic life or what kind of ground cover is there. Now, I know what you're thinking, yeah, that's great, but what if I don't know a trout from a tuna? Or what if I get it wrong? Well, that's okay. First of all, not only do these sites have really, really good tutorials and guides to help you through this sort of thing, but they also have the data checked by several people. So the same image you see will be presented to three, four, maybe five or six different people. So don't worry, you can't screw it up. Okay, now, hands up everyone here who has gotten sucked into one of these games like Candy Crush or Farmville or, you know, Mafia Wars, the rest of you are lying. I know I have. And I know when I do play them that I sometimes feel like they're great entertainment and they're great for decompressing and so on, but you sometimes feel like you should be doing something a little bit more productive. Yeah, I can tell by the laughter you were lying. In any case, with web-based or, or with citizen science games, you can actually enjoy the games and get the entertainment value out of them, but be doing something good for science as well. So one I show here is called Fraxinus. It's on Facebook, and it's a genetic puzzle game where you actually try and figure out uh, the, the, the right sequence there, and it's to help determine uh, why ash trees are prone to dying from a particular fungus. The other one I show here is called Eterna and it has to do with RNA, ribonucleic acid. And that's the stuff inside us that codes and decodes our genes and helps us express our genes. And you're presented with 
a particular shape, like they show on the screen, and you take the four colored dots, which represents the nucleotides, and you just arrange them and see how that changes the shape. And the idea behind the game is you try and make your string into the shape you see. And there are hundreds of different possible combinations, so your solution might be completely different from the next person who does it. And this one's quite fun. I played it myself. Citizen Science, well, yes, of course, there's an app for that. There's an app for everything these days. And here I show five. You can do things on your cell phone. The first one is called Instant Wild. And this one has you get images from remote cameras that are located in wildlife preserves all around the world. And these cameras are constantly taking pictures. They send you the pictures and you simply identify what you see in the picture using a field guide that you're provided. And in so doing, you give researchers and conservationists real-time data about what populations are doing and how they're faring and how many times they're sighted and it allows them to make smarter decisions about what's going on in that particular area. The second one is called Sound Around You. And you simply take your phone where you are and you do a sound clip, record something, and you upload it to the server. And we know, and we're doing this because we know that constant levels of noise can affect us physically and mentally. And we also know that more and more people are moving into increasingly urban areas. What is that going to do to us individually and as a society over time? This starts getting a handle on that problem by getting real-time data. The third one is a problem you might not think too much about, light pollution. It used to be that the stars were so very important to us. We used to use them to navigate by and to tell time by. But these days, with things like car headlamps and fast food signs and street lights, we can't see half of the stars that are in the sky. And that's when we remember to look up. By t using this app and trying to inform them about which stars you can actually see, you, get, you give the researchers a better idea of how bad the light pollution is in your area. And this will help inform us as to how can we stop washing out our view of the stars. The fourth one is called Marine Debris Tracker. And it works a lot like Foursquare. You just do a check-in whenever you see debris by your local waterway. And this one's important because it helps authorities look after their waterways more cheaply and more efficiently. Because they're not having to go out and run inspections for every single waterway, they get the data in real time, and they can go deal with the problem as it happens. Next one is called Hummingbirds at Home. And this one, I love hummingbirds because they're, they're such amazing, tough little characters that, that travel long distances. And this one wants you to go out into your garden patch and take pictures of the hummingbirds that show up, what flowers they prefer, and this will let researchers know what species are in your area. It will let them compare that data to what species should be in your area, give them a better idea of how things are changing in your environment. Now, with this level, you can really get your hands dirty. I talked earlier about the bee problem, and as you might suspect, there are citizen science projects dealing with bees. And the first one is called Befriend Your Garden. Much like the hummingbird one, it talks about, or has you go out into your garden and look at the pollinating plants and what insects are on them and what kind of things they prefer. And if you're really brave, you can try Native Buzz. And that one wants you to build a nesting site for solitary bees and wasps. And you can get one of their kits, and by so doing, also support the project financially, or you can do a DIY thing. Monarch Watch is another really, really cool one. You can actually get a garden kit sent to your house full of the flowers and plants that monarchs prefer to eat from. And you can beautify your house at the same time and help provide a place for monarchs to eat at and also act as a way station when they do their incredible migration all the way down to Mexico. And even cooler than that, you can actually buy a larval kit and raise monarchs from the larval stage and release them from your backyard. So you can do actual conservation work yourself at your house. And I wasn't kidding earlier when I said you could get your hands dirty. Shark Finder is an awesome project. What they do with that one is they send you ocean sediments, dirt, stuff that's millions of years old, 
and they send it to your home and they want you to look through it for shark and ray and skate fossils. So you can be a paleontologist at your kitchen table. Now my children and I were involved in a similar project last year called Mastodon Matrix. And with it, they sent us a bag of dirt from an excavation site where there had been a mastodon. And we looked through it for things like algae spores and mastodon hair and um, shell fragments and plant fragments and so on. And the idea behind that one was to give researchers a better idea of what life was like during the time of the mastodons. And of course, the kids loved it. It was getting dirty, it was playing with the microscope, it was looking for stuff and finding puzzles and, com and <clears throat> competing with each other about what they'd found. It was a great project and great family time. Now, I've talked quite a bit about what you can do with citizen science. And I bet you're wondering, at least a little bit, because it's a perfectly natural thing to wonder about, well, that's great, but what could I get out of it personally? So the first thing is that a lot of these sites do actually offer recognition for your work. This might happen in the form of earning badges at the site because a lot of these projects are gamified. It might be that you see your name up on the scoreboard and you, you know, leaderboard for all of the different things that you do. It might also be that you get your name on a scientific paper because some of these projects that are publishing the results will put participant names on the paper. Or if you're involved in one of the astronomy projects, you might actually get credit for discovering something that nobody has ever seen before. They have 10-year-olds who have been credited with finding things like exoplanets and comets and different types of asteroids. I joked earlier about those games, but I'm not kidding when I say that you can relax, and decompress after a week's work, and play these games and not feel the slightest bit guilty about them. So you do get the relaxation value. The modern era, too, has been really tough on our institutions. Things like our governments, surely, our education systems, our churches, and we've all become perhaps a little bit cynical and a little bit ap apathetic. And I'm not gonna stand here and try and tell you that citizen science is the path to enlightenment, but it is a way to belong to something bigger than yourself and to inject maybe just a little bit more meaning and purpose into your everyday life. You can pick your favorite topic, or you can deep dive into something you know nothing about and go exploring. And in so doing, you can learn and protect yourself. And this is going to be increasingly important as we go further into the 21st century. Things like genetically modified food and climate change, these are heavily debated in the media today. And when you get directly involved and understand the science behind them, you won't be so easily swayed by special interest groups on either side of the argument. So in that case, you'll be able to make better informed decisions. Now, I've just brushed the surface of what's available here. There is so much more I could speak to. But here's the takeaway. Citizen science is fun, it's easy, and you can get involved today. And I hope you do. Thank you.